If you want to keep Hebrews chapter 11 open in your laps, that will be an outline of our sermon this evening. Starting in verse 1, Hebrews writer says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things never seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. And it's by faith that we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And the things which are seen were not made by things which are visible. Do you know for certain, with absolute certainty, that God created the heavens and the earth? And if you do, how? Were you there when the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters? Were you there when God spoke into existence the things in this universe in Psalm 34 and verses 6 and 7? Were you there when everything that was made, which was made through Jesus Christ, the Word that became flesh according to John chapter 1? How do you know that God created the heavens and the earth? And do you know with absolute certainty that a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth lived and walked upon this earth. A man who was the Son of God, God in the flesh, a sinless man who was the perfect sacrifice for the imperfections of all mankind. A man who was crucified, buried in a borrowed tomb, and he was raised on the third day. And how do you know? Did you ever see Jesus? Did you ever watch him as he walked from village to village upon this guilty sod? Were you there when the tomb was opened? Were you there when Jesus rose from the dead? And do you know with absolute certainty that this man named Jesus is going to come again? And on the day in which he comes, the Bible says there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And how do you know that to be true? Have you ever seen somebody resurrected from the dead? Were you there when Lazarus, with the stench of death, was raised? Were you there when the widow of Nain's son was given back to her? How do you know that there will be a resurrection? I suppose that you would respond to these questions in the same manner in which I would. That I am not ashamed to believe in things that I have never seen. Because the things that I have seen, Help me to know that the things that I have never seen are true because those things come from God. What's the first word that comes to your mind when you think about Hebrews chapter 11? I know what you're thinking, and that word is faith. And we call this the hall of faith. And why do we call it that? Well, because it is full of men and women and all the feats of faith that they accomplished in their life and how they triumphed in their faith over things that most people could not triumph over. And often when we preach from this chapter of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, we always preach a sermon that has this kind of mantra, that the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. And it's true, and I'll never back down from that assertion. But this evening, I want to focus on a phrase that you find in the very first verse that I believe oftentimes goes very unappreciated. And that is this, believing in things you have never seen. Let's just walk down through Hebrews chapter 11 in a narrative form. And let's look at some individuals who believed in things that they had never seen. And hopefully their faith will build your faith. Let's begin with a man whose name was Noah. This was a man who was divinely warned of things that he had never seen. In fact, if you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and you start in verse 7, the Bible says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to the faith. Focus in on that phrase right there. It says that he was divinely warned of things not yet seen. Let's interview this man by the name of Noah for a second. Noah, when God came to you and said that he was going to destroy the world by water, how did you know that to be true? Had you ever seen a flood before? You see, 
at the time of the flood in Genesis chapter 6, how many worldwide floods had taken place? Zero. In fact, if you go to Genesis chapter 2 and you read the creation account, the Bible says that God had not caused rain to come down upon the earth. And then a mist came from the grounds and watered that which needed nutrients. It's quite the possibility that when the flood comes upon the earth in Genesis chapter 7, that it had never once rained a single drop. Yet Noah went about preaching a flood that was going to come upon this earth. Wherein God was going to destroy this world because of the sin that existed within it. You know, sometimes when we encounter unexpected events in our life, what do we do? Well, we rely upon things of the past and historical precedents. Well, they did this in this traumatic event, and this is what I'm going to do. Who did Noah have to rely upon? What flood did he have to point to and say, they did this in this flood, so this is what I'm going to do? He had no one. In fact, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Question, how did Peter know what Noah preached? And Jude tells us that Noah's great-grandfather, whose name was Enoch, was also a preacher of righteousness. Question, how did Jude know what Enoch preached? Well, the only explanation is divine inspiration. And there was a man whose name was... Methuselah. Methuselah was the grandfather of this man by the name of Noah. Do you know what Methuselah's name means? When he dies, it shall come. Noah was the grandson of a man who lived 969 years. Methuselah lived longer than anyone in the history of the world. And why did Methuselah live longer than anyone else? It was a testament to the long-suffering of God. Noah preached righteousness for 120 years. God gave people chance after chance after chance to turn from their sinful ways. And do you suppose it was the case that when Noah was preaching this message of righteousness, that people questioned what he was preaching? When Noah went about preaching to a lost and dying world, don't you know God is going to bring a great flood upon this earth? He's going to destroy the world by water because of the sin. And if you don't get on the ark, you're going to be destroyed. You think somebody raised their hand and said, wait a second, Noah. You said something about a flood. Can you describe that to me? I don't really, I'm not familiar with the word. You suppose somebody raised their hand and said, wait a second, Noah, you said something about God destroying the world. I've never, God's never destroyed the world. I've never seen that. I've never even heard of such a thing. Why should I believe you? Noah did something that had never been done. He prepared an ark for a flood that had never yet come. And do you suppose that Noah was afraid? It says that he was moved with godly fear. I believe that Noah, when this flood came upon the world, could not possibly fathom with his finite, limited mind the destruction that would come as a result of what God was doing with this water that Noah was probably as surprised by this devastation as those who did not listen to Noah and refused to get on the ark. But Noah did it anyway. He believed in things that he had never seen, and he built an ark. Oh, and a few thousand years later, Peter would reflect upon this in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he would say in verse 19, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering, that's the patience of God, waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. How do you like that? Baptism, which is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer, the appeal of a good conscience toward God. 120 years! of preaching of righteousness. And what did it result in? Eight souls were saved. And they were the family of Noah. Your greatest ministry in life is your family. Your greatest responsibility is to ensure that your family one day will be in eternity with God in heaven. Noah fulfilled that task, even though he was not able to persuade any person on the outside to get on the ark. 
He did what God told him to do because he put his faith and his trust in things he had never seen. And what about that man by the name of Abraham? Start reading in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And here it is. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going. Let's interview Abraham for a second. Abraham, when God told you that you were going to receive an inheritance and a piece of land, did you know where you were going? I mean, had you been there before? No, I had not. Wait a second, that doesn't really add up. I mean, you're wealthy, you're established, you have a reputation, you're living in the only city that you've ever known. Why in the world would you pick up everything that you've ever known and move to a place that you've never been just because God told you to do it? That seems like an awful lot to give up. And Abraham, when you were going the way that you were going to this land that God told you about, did you know that was the way you should be going? You'd never been there before. No, I I didn't. I want you to put yourself in Abraham's sandals for a second. At the age of 75, Abraham picks up everything that he's ever known. And God tells him to two barren individuals, you are never going to have Children, Abraham, you're never going to have a child, Sarah. And then God comes and says, I'm going to bless you with a son. And through that son is going to come descendants that shall number the sands of the seashore. Five years pass and Abraham's 80 and still no son. Ten years pass and Abraham turns 85 and there's still no son. Fifteen years pass and Abraham turns 90 and there's still no son. 20 years pass, and Abraham turns 95. There's still no son. God, don't you know, I'm not getting any younger. When's this son coming that you've blessed me with? And at the age of 99, and Sarah at the age of 90, the son is born, and he's named Isaac. And now the question becomes, Abraham, do you know anyone who is your age that is raising an infant? No. I mean, I know that we're early in the patriarchal age. People lived longer then. But we know just as well as as anything that it was not common for 90-year-olds to have an infant. But my Bible tells me that Abraham trusted in God. Notice verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac... And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, And Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now put yourself back in Abraham's sandals. Twenty years passed, God never blessed you. But finally, at the age of 99, you had the son that God said you would have. And as you're enjoying upbringing him and raising him, God comes to you one day and says, Abraham, you know that only begotten son that I promised you and that I I took a little bit of time to give you? You you know the son that's going to bring all your descendants into this world? I want you to kill him. I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. I want you to take a knife and plunge it through his heart. Isaac doesn't have a wife yet. He has no children. Abraham knows if he kills Isaac, he kills his descendants, and thus the promise of God is not going to be fulfilled. How do you believe Abraham felt? But I love this this word right here. He concluded. King James Version says he accounted. It means literally to make a mental calculation. He thought about it. And he knew that God was able to raise his son Isaac up from the dead. Question, how did he know that? Had Abraham ever seen a resurrection of the dead? How many resurrections from the dead do you read about from Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 21? Zero. So how did Abraham know that God was able to raise his son up from the dead? Because he trusted 
and put the fullness of his faith in him who is faithful as he promised. And this thing that was near and precious to the heart of Abraham, this belief in things that he had never seen, it's passed on down to his descendants. You think about his own son Isaac. You remember the story. As he gets older, he has two sons, twin nations, Jacob and Esau. But Isaac's eyesight is waning. Oh, and his wife and his son Jacob, they devise a plan, a scheme against him to draw the blessing from Esau to Jacob. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 to verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come, things that he would never live to see, things that he never saw with his own eyes. But by faith, he believed in things that he did not see. And he knew that God would work all things together for good. And what about Joseph? You remember the favored son of Jacob, the grandson of Isaac. Joseph's story is one for the ages. I mean, this was a man who was despised by his brothers because of that coat of many colors. And he's sold into slavery. And then he ends up in prison. He interprets dreams. And you know the whole journey that he takes until eventually he rises to prominence through the providence of God in the land of Egypt to be the right-hand man of the king of all of Egypt, Pharaoh. And as Joseph is getting near his death, the Hebrews writer reflects on his life and what he said. In Hebrews 11 and verse 22, the Bible says, By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now wait a second. When Joseph was living, the relationship that existed between the Egyptians and the Israelites was a good relationship. I mean, the Egyptians gave them the best of the best of the lands, the land of Goshen. It was a place where there was plentiful to meet the needs of the people. How did he know that eventually there would come a time when the children of Israel would depart? They're living in luxury. They're living in pleasure. They're living in prosperity at this moment in time. How did he know? If you go to Genesis chapter 50, these came from the very words of Joseph. In verse 25, he took an oath from the children of Israel. And this is what he said, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. If you ever wanted to die in all the glory and all the royalty, where did you want to be buried? Egypt. I mean, think about the tombs and the immaculate treasures that are found in Egypt even today. Surely a man like Joseph, who had arose to prominence in Egypt, the right-hand man of Pharaoh, would have a beautiful tomb that would be built for him in all glory and all royalty. But Joseph says, no, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. In fact, there's going to come a time when God is going to visit his people. And when that time comes, I want you to carry up my bones. Take me back home. How did Joseph know that that time would come? He believed in things he had never seen. What about Moses? Oh, you know the story of Moses. In fact, I want you to start reading with me here in verse 23 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. and They were not afraid of the king's commandments. Isn't that amazing that Moses' parents feared God more than they feared the king? By faith, Moses, when he had come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in all of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Moses didn't fear the king either. He feared God more. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith, 
And they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were, were drowned. Let's interview Moses for a second. Moses, do you trust in the Pharaoh that you know, that you've seen, in whose house you have been raised? Or do you trust in the God that you have never seen and that you've only ever heard of? I trust in the God that I've never seen. Why? Because of what I have seen. I've seen God form a people, keep them in all prosperity and protection for His own purposes. And because of what I have seen, I know that what I have not seen is true. So the Passover... In a few months, this is what we're going to do. I want you to kill an unblemished lamb, firstborn. Here's the specific instructions of how you're going to kill it and what you're going to do with it. I want you to take the blood of the lamb. Isn't that a foreshadow to Jesus in the New Testament? And I want you to put it on the doorposts and the lintels of the house so that when my death angel passes over the house, your firstborn shall be spared. But if you don't do the things that I've told you to do, Your firstborn will die. You think one of the Israelites spoke up and said, Oh, yeah, wait a second. Did God do that two years ago? No. They'd never seen it. Yet by faith, they believed it. And what about the Red Sea? The children of Israel were on the run from Pharaoh's army. Pharaoh said you can go, but he lied. He went to go get them and bring them back into bondage. But eventually they found themselves between Pharaoh's army who was in hot pursuit of them and an immovable structure in the Red Sea. Moses lifted up his rod, his staff, over the the waters. And what happened? You reckon the Israelites, when they were being pursued by Pharaoh's army and came to the Red Sea, looked to Moses and said, Moses, you remember what God did a couple years ago? When he parted that sea, why don't we do that again? Never happened. But they trusted that it would. Have you ever seen an entire sea part straight down the middle to allow enough water to move out of the way so there would be enough dry land for millions of Israelites to walk safely upon? Now, Perhaps one of the things that we underestimate when we're talking about the Red Sea is the faith that it took to walk through those walls of water, knowing that at any moment of time, if these walls of water crashed, I'm dead. But it wasn't the children of Israel that was swallowed up by the water. It was Pharaoh's army that was swallowed up by the water. Moses trusted and believed in things he had never seen. I believe that Hebrews chapter 11 is a beautiful embodiment of what you read in James chapter 2 and verse 18. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Have you ever seen God part the waters of the Red Sea? Did you witness the Passover with your own eyes? Oh, and what about the sacrifice of Isaac? Were you there when Abraham raised the knife to take his son's life? And what about Joseph? Were you there to hear the words that he spoke concerning his bones? And Isaac, when he was deceived by Jacob? And gave him the blessing. What about Noah? Were you there when God shut them into the ark? And the flood waters destroyed the world? No. I wasn't. 
but I believe every word of it. Because I am not ashamed to believe in things that I've never seen. Because the things that I have seen tell me that the things that I have never seen, if they are of God, they are true. Habakkuk would put it this way in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. The just shall live by his faith. You and I, we, we don't walk by sight. You and I, we walk by faith. And it doesn't mean that faith is blind faith. It doesn't mean that there is no evidence to our faith. But isn't it a wonderful and beautiful conundrum that the evidence of our faith as New Testament Christians is oftentimes the things that we've never seen. And that is why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. And notice verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. It's absolutely amazing to me. We believe in things we have never seen because the things that we see came from things that we cannot see. John chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas, you are blessed because you have believed, because you've seen. But blessed are those who believe and have not seen. 